I'm just going to say it's a little bit of a tradition. We don't have many, but we got one. Larry, are you ready for just the facts? I am ready. Just the facts. The 49ers are in the Super Bowl for the eighth time in franchise history, for the first time since 2019, obviously. The 49ers, eight trips to the Super Bowl, now tied for the second most in NFL history. Only New England has more. New England's been to the Super Bowl 11 times. But Dallas, Denver, Pittsburgh, and now the San Francisco 49ers have all made eight appearances in the biggest game available. The Niners are now 6-5 and five in NFC title games at home, but still 8-11 and 11 overall. Just shows you how hard it is to get to the Super Bowl. Uh, their 38 playoff wins, however, though, Larry, that's the most in NFL history. The Niners are still sitting on top of postseason excellence in that regard. They've won more playoff games than any other franchise in NFL history. And needless to say, winning playoff game number 39 is one of the biggest moments in franchise history if it actually happens because that would be a sixth Lombardi trophy. And Kyle Shanahan... The guy who can't win big games, he won another big game. He's now eight and three in the postseason. He hasn't won the biggest yeah. game, but he's eight and three in the postseason. That's a very he, good record. He's won at least two postseason games in every single postseason he's ever appeared in. And he is now the 49ers all time franchise winning, winning percentage leader in the postseason. Not bad. There's some other coaches that have had pretty successful postseason runs in franchise history, and Kyle wins at a greater clip than anyone at this point in his very young, still he's only 44-year-old career. Good stuff. I mean, that it shows that, you know, um, for all the criticism and for all the people that have taken shots, the guy does win in the playoffs. He really does. Now, he hasn't won the ultimate prize, but, um, you know, it, a lot of there's a lot, you know people that have suggested they should banish Kyle and go in a different direction. It's like, hey, wait a second, you know, is isn't this guy in a lot of ways Andy Reid pre Mahomes? There are 18, I believe, is the number living people who have won a Super Bowl as a head coach. 18 living humans on the planet who have done that. So you know the fact that Kyle hasn't done it yet isn't really the dunk on him that a lot of people think it is. And if he does do it, no one's going to be able to dunk on you. Kyle's going to be Dikembe Mutombo. You're not going to be able to dunk on him anymore. If he gets one, he'll get three, in my opinion. If he, you know, he's got to get that first one. But if he gets one, I think he'll there'll be more to follow. Well, you know, it depends on how long the Niners can keep that window open because the disease of more will certainly infect any team that wins a championship. Um they got a great equation going right now, though. They got a young coach. They got a young quarterback. They're kicking ass in free agency because they're doing it the right way. They're allowing the rank and file free agent to walk. They're taking compensatory picks. They're reinvesting in younger players in the draft. They're hitting on day three and after the draft uh, with undrafted free agents. And they're playing free agency like a fiddle. So, um, you know. Now, Hargrave wasn't great yesterday, but Hargrave, Mooney Ward, going after that one great player, um, I think is the right approach to free agency. And, and they're, good they're years. doing it. You're, I mean, you're not in the game that they didn't play well in without them, right? Right. Uh, Hargrave was a big part of this regular season. He hasn't been a bit a big part of the postseason. I, we haven't really used his name yet, which maybe means the Niners, they're due. You know, they haven't played well in the postseason, and maybe they're saving their best for last. And last time I checked, that's a pretty good thing to do when you reach a Super Bowl. Maybe play your best game of the year then. We'll see. We will and, and, and Brock Purdy, by the way, he hasn't come from behind and won a lot of games in his career because he's had a big a lot of leads. But one of them was they were down 10 in the fourth quarter in Vegas. Um, and he led them to tie the game, forced overtime, and beat the Raiders in overtime. His, you know, last year, so he has had a come from behind victory in that stadium. Well, and you know, Dan Campbell decisions aside, Larry. 
Brock Purdy was just the architect, the chief architect of the largest comeback in the history of the NFC Championship game. And we continue our Just the Facts looking at this comeback. The 49ers are the first team in NFL history to be down 17 or more points at halftime of a championship game and come back to win the game. They also overcame a 17-point deficit uh, against the Atlanta Falcons yeah, in 2012. But again, that wasn't just in the second half. The Falcons got up way early uh, on the Niners, and then they started their comeback. But the, the, they couldn't have been in a worse situation than they were at halftime, and they dug their way out of it. And a big reason why they dug their way out of it, as much as we have given all the flowers to Brock Purdy, who deserves them today, let's talk about Christian McCaffrey. Because with 132 yards from scrimmage and two touchdowns, McCaffrey became the third player in NFL history to have 50 or more yards from scrimmage and one or more touchdowns in each of their first six career playoff games. Wow. So when the money's on the table, Christian's got, you know, pocket aces. He's coming for it. McCaffrey became the first 49er running back in franchise history to have two or more rushing touchdowns in consecutive playoff games. He, with all due respect to Brock and the playmakers and everyone around him, to Christian McCaffrey is the heart and soul of everything that happens all year long since they've traded for him. He really is. He is in the middle of all of their success. As much as a quarterback stands in the middle of a team's offensive success, this running back stands, you know, right next to Brock Purdy, if not on Brock Purdy's toes, making the argument, maybe I'm the straw that stirs the drink. McCaffrey is unquestionably special, and everyone lays off of him because there's there's no argument to be made other than with a Lombardi trophy, a week. How about this? Let's say it's Christian McCaffrey who wins the MVP of the Super Bowl and he gets a Lombardi trophy. He has automatically punched his ticket to Canton, Larry. He goes from, I think he's in the Hall of Fame to he's in the Hall of Fame. Great, great player. No question. And, and the way he came out of in the third quarter, it was like this, you know, he, when he scored that touchdown, it was like he, he wasn't just, he wasn't happy. He was, you could see he was like still kind of pissed. You know, he's like, you know, like we should be, we should be in this game. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the guy's a hell of a teammate. I mean, and he, and he gives it a hundred percent. I mean, he, he he's he's carrying off plays or play fakes on the backside. Um, you know, with the same aggressiveness and the same focus as he does when he's getting the ball on the doorstep and fourth and one or whatever. I mean, the guy is just totally committed to winning every play. He's an ultimate team guy. Look, I got good football eyes. He jukes me out like a poorly trained cameraman on some of his play action fakes. <laughs> he really does. Um, uh, let's talk about Brock Purdy here in just the facts because Purdy was 20 of 31 passing in the NFC championship game, 267 uh, yards, a touchdown. He threw an interception. He finished with a passer rating of 89, which is pedestrian for him. What is not pedestrian was it, it's funny. He had a career high pass attempts in the Packers divisional round, which was funny and odd. And we talked an awful lot about that. A career playoff high, 48 yards rushing for Brock Purdy. The fifth touchdown, uh, uh, his passing touchdown was the fifth of his career already. And with the win, Purdy, who had two playoff wins as a rookie, became the fourth quarterback in football history to win at least four playoff games in their first two career seasons. And if he wins the Super Bowl, he's going to be tied with Ben Roethlisberger for five playoff wins in the first two years of your career. Now, Ben Roethlisberger wasn't like a gaudy stats guy, but he was a physical specimen, a beast. And, you know, everyone quickly was like, oh, this, this Ben Roethlisberger guy is pretty good. Oh, this guy from a, a small college, a less than matters an awful lot college. You know, Miami of Ohio. Who, who, wow. And like, cradle you know, of coaches, Miami of Ohio. Yeah, but he but, also was a great runner and thrower on the run there. But again, he had a body type that allowed people to quickly see like, oh, yeah, I should probably get behind what this guy's doing, winning at the clip he's winning at so early in his career. 
But, you know, Brock is 30 pounds lighter, three inches shorter, and easy to underestimate. So people just keep on doing that. Uh, secretly, without much fanfare, which is odd because we talked so much about the Garner Johnson Debo matchup coming into this game, and there was the bad blood that everyone knew about. Debo Samuel had a playoff career high eight catches and a team high 89 yards. It wasn't a great Debo Samuel game, but when he did touch the ball, he was moving chains and he was just providing the momentum needed that this team needed. It went, went, I mean, he he didn't do much, and yet he did a ton all at the same time. He really, that, big game for Debo. Debo was great. Back to Purdy, though, for a second. One thing that was really interesting is that when you looked at some of the teams that beat the Lions this year, the, the the Lions run defense three worst games were against Baltimore and uh Chicago. And those run offenses combined for 471 rushing yards. And the the common denominator is they both had mobile quarterbacks. Fields and Lamar Jackson combined for 48% of the rushing yards in those games against Detroit. Um, when the Lions faced the Niners yesterday, the Niners had the third ranked rush offense. But man, it was the Brock Purdy 58, 58 yards on five carries and three huge runs in the second half that made the Niner rushing attack, you know, um, really formidable. So, I mean, give give Purdy credit on that one is in that, man, I mean, and I don't know if it was part of the game plan where it was like, hey, you know what? Look at these look at the teams that have had success against Detroit. The quarterback often gets out of the pocket and runs. Maybe that was something they kind of knew about because he he when the when the money was on the table and and the thing was breaking down and he needed to run, uh, he was decisive. He was decisive about running on this team. So it was great to see. I don't I don't think they win without um the all three of those late late for those late second half runs. I you know, it sounds like something who didn't know the specifics and to talk about football granularly. And so you're going to say something broad in general, like, you know, he really feels the game, which sounds like a kind of a candy ass way to describe. It. I really don't know how to say it. So I'm just going to tell you, you feel, but there's the truth there. Brock Purdy feels a game. He feels it around him. He feels the pocket around him. And look, sometimes he feels it collapsing and it does because it has. You well, know, and the other thing, Dar Damon, he plays for the W. I mean, you know, it's it's this guy's greatest thing. I mean, let's just be honest about this. The best quarterbacks we've ever seen are guys that we here in the Bay Area have seen firsthand. Joe Montana, Tom Brady, and neither of those guys had overwhelming physical traits, even though Joe was a very underrated athlete, great basketball player, could dunk, it was very had unbelievable escape ability, and Brady had way better arm strength than ever anybody ever thought coming out of Michigan. Steve but Young what, had wheels, but he was no physical specimen by any stretch of the imagination. But what these guys all really had, Steve, Steve and I'm glad you brought up Young because Young had it, it absolutely tons of this, and what Brock Purdy has, it's this rare, super crazy, maniacal, call it dysfunctional if you want competitiveness what makes jordan jordan the fact that he gets to his hall of fame speech and he's still trying to dunk on people he, you know what i mean he the great ones larry bird was a crazy competitor michael jordan is a crazy competitor steph curry ripped his jersey the other day because he lost a game he played great in because he's a crazy competitor that's what brock purdy Derek jeter crazy competitor uh, Montana, Brady, and now you're watching Brock Purdy. He's a crazy competitor. He is going to compete. I told him that Brandon Allen said he was a better golfer than him earlier this year and that he was going to take his money, and he's like, I'll get good and I'll take his money. He wants to win. You know, we have all had that kid. I mean, my, my kid, my oldest son, Kevin, who's our producer on this show, he was a crazy competitor. Um, you know, he wants to win at everything all the time. Um, and it's just, you either have that gene or you don't. And Brock Purdy has that gene. And what did he do in the fourth quarter? What it's, he's going to do whatever he has to do because then it gets down to, it's not about 
timing or anything. It's about desire to win and, and your competitive fire. And that's why Brock keeps playing big at the end of games in some of these games. Cause it's like, Whoa, um, he's got now it's like, forget the mechanics, forget my rhythm. And now I'm just playing cause I want to win really badly. And those three running plays were just like screaming out. I don't care if I take a hit, I want to win badly. And Favre had it. And so many of the great ones have it. Mahomes absolutely has it. And Purdy has it. And it's, you can't see it. It's not definable. You don't see it at the combine. It doesn't appear on the wonder lick. Um, it, it's literally, it, you, you know, you just, you either have to identify it somehow, some way by watching film or that's it. And this guy has crazy competitive fire. So that's why his teammates love him. Because he doesn't show up for the glory. He doesn't show up for the cash. He doesn't show up for the girls. He shows up because, you know, he's a man of faith and he's all about beating you. And um, he just really likes playing football. He I mean, loves that, playing football, but he's a competitor, man. The guy yeah. is super competitive. He is. He is. I mean, it, uh, everyone out there is. Even the least competitive dude on a football field is still more competitive than the average person. I mean, to even reach any position in professional athletics means you are in the one, the the, the type A fraction of the one percent of the world of of you want it. Um, but a lot of guys they get burnt out. A lot of guys have you know wanted it so bad by the time they actually got it, they're like, all right, I'm good. Um, you know, look, maybe Brock Purdy does get that big paycheck one day. And the next thing, you know, it's all Lamborghinis and sunglasses, money changes people, but I, I don't think he's going to be subjected to that. I don't think we're going to have Brock Purdy, uh, you know, caught with, uh, with, with, uh, you know, a, a, a dead woman or a live boy at any point in time in his career. You know, this guy just seems to have been raised right. And he just flies so straight. To be a really good quarterback in this league doesn't just mean you get it done on game day either. You handle the media. You handle the pressure. You handle the spotlight. You handle the podium. He does it all like a 10-year NFL vet two years into his career. It's very special. Again, a lot of people can only see physical traits, and that's why a lot of people were on team Trey Lance because of where he was drafted, what was given up to draft him in that spot and look at the physicality and the, 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 you know, just look at this guy. Wouldn't that be awesome if he were the future? And then you look at the other guy and it's so easy to underestimate him. But if you could look inside, like it, it, if it were tangible, we could measure it. It's not. So it's an intangible. We can't measure it. What everyone used to say, you know, the biggest problem with a concussion is a concussion doesn't limp. That's why we don't really respect them. It took a while for the NFL to start respecting the severity of concussions for even fans to understand the severity of concussions because a concussion doesn't limp. So you don't really have any sympathy for it. And I guess Brock Purdy doesn't present himself as I'm the baddest motherfucker on this field, but he is, he is all the time almost. So, um, you know, Kyle Shanahan is is like that a little too. He's professorial. He's calm. He's not a screamer. He doesn't overly emote when things are going poorly or well. You know, the camera doesn't love him the way it loves Dan Campbell. Um, Kyle Shanahan is drawing up plays to kill you. <laughs> You know, he is he is a huge competitor himself. You know, the guy who just didn't have enough of a physical ability to play football. So he said, all right, how can I get back at the world of football? I'm going to become <laughs> one of the hardest strategize, uh, you know, best strategy guys this league has ever seen. And it's paying off early for him in his career. And I'm really happy that he gets to avoid the landmine that would have him been losing a third straight championship game. How about this? Larry, you said, you know, if Kyle wins one Super Bowl, he might win three. Had he lost the NFC title game Sunday night? I don't know if he ever wins one. And 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 there is an element to where 
no matter what Kyle does in the Super Bowl, no matter what happens, and I know no Niner fan wants to hear anything other than they won the Lombardi Trophy, and I get it. I want them to. But they're, I mean, next season would have been ruined by an NFC Championship game loss. The entirety of next season. Like, sure, we could have gotten into the moment of you and me breaking down an exciting game. Like, it, we, we, we would have found our fun because we always find fun in a football season somewhere. There's always drama that you get wrapped up in. But the umbrella that all of next year would have been underneath is the umbrella of it doesn't matter what you do in the regular season. When you get to the playoffs, Kyle is going to gag it away. Well, we we said the reality of their situation was if they lost in the NFC playoffs to anybody, that they would be underachievers. Now they can, you know, whatever happens, they are not underachievers. They they did not underachieve this year if they lose the Super Bowl. Uh, obviously it's all about winning the Super Bowl and climbing to the top of that mountain. And Purdy said it like five times yesterday at the podium. Yeah, we got one more. We got one more. It's like he's not going to celebrate this t championship, NFC championship, like it means anything because the job, the task, the goal was the sixth Lombardi, and they don't have the sixth Lombardi. They're still one win away. By so the way, I can't help but notice, and I am enough of a of a like a curmudgeon to tell you that every single time we see baseball teams popping champagne like i mean how many champagne parties do you need on the way to a postseason like it, it drives me nuts how much champagne we see in clubhouses that technically still haven't won anything the division series celebration exactly. yeah yeah it, every it, single person including the the uh you know clubbies are wearing like goggles I even mean, they've been planning for it forever but you right. know it's a long grind so i'm i don't begrudge baseball players for celebrating but, sure. but you I, know what? The, 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 the NFL season is a harder grind. You may be not playing as often, but oh my God, does this sport put a tax on your body? And you don't see guys popping champagne. Was there any champagne in the 49ers no. locker room last night, Larry? No. I, there were some cigars. There were some victory cigars. How about this, too, by the way? You're the Detroit Lions. You go into the dr dressing room at halftime with 148 rushing yards. You're on your way to a 300-yard <laughs> rushing day because you're going to run more because you got the lead in the second half, right? You're on your way to a 300-yard rushing day with David Montgomery averaging almost seven yards a carry, and they come out in the second half and run for only 34 yards. That's amazing. I did not have that on my bingo card, and I don't think any Lions can. Uh, 34 think yards of rushing in the second half in a game that you're up 27 to 7? By the way, they had like 50,000 fans. Uh, 24 to 7? At like Ford Field watching on big screens, and that place was going bonkers and was quiet as a church mouse. At it's a cold day in Detroit today, I guarantee you. Huh. January twenty January 29th, the day after you gag away a trip to the Super Bowl in Detroit, Michigan, with the winter and the whole deal. Oh man. By the way, if everyone Brutal. would like to see the single greatest rap video ever made, homemade rap video, when you're done watching Wake Up This Morning, Google it's so cold in the D. It's so cold in the D. <laughs> Why the fuck can't we just have peace? Oh, dude, it's it is a cold day in the D. And Eminem, way, Eminem was there last night. Did you see that? And everyone, the double birds. I hope that entire section pointed to him where the exact parking lot was. It's that way, buddy. Go back to eight mile. You what? How about Chauncey Gardner Johnson waving goodbye to the crowd in the second quarter? Dude, talk about something that didn't age well. It's you're so you're waving goodbye to the crowd in the second quarter and the cheap shot that he took on Debo. That was he just did something take else. A cheap man. shot on Debo, too. He did. He did. Debo shows up in the post game wearing a snakeskin jacket with a smile on his face. Oh, that's the best look there is. It really is. Uh, just a couple more facts, Larry, before yes. we hop into some chats and open up to what people want to talk about here. Um, Nick Bosa, two sacks in the NFC title game, is now the third time in his career that he's recorded two or more sacks in a playoff game. 
So even though Bosa didn't record one last season, the whole Bosa disappears in the postseason is probably a, you know a, a narrative that needs to disappear a little bit, at least for the week. And oh, by the way, his 10 sacks in playoff games is now the most in 49ers team history. Charles Haley had seven and a half. Eric Armstead has seven. So Nick Bosa and Christian McCaffrey in a short time have established themselves as two of the best to have ever done it for the 49ers. And let's say you weren't rooting for either team last night. You didn't care. All you wanted to do was watch a good game. And that first half opens up in a way where you think, oh, man, this isn't a good game. Am I even going to turn the game off at halftime? Maybe I'll check it in the third quarter, see if it got interesting. If you were, if you weren't having a heart attack, if that wasn't a heart attack on a plate game for you, what a game that was to watch last night. Just for the impartial observer, there were only two punts in the entire game, Larry. Only two punts for two teams that say, you know, we play a lot of defense over here too. It's not just offenses that got us into the, only two punts in that game. What a game. What a game. I, I You know what? I saw there was a number of people that said 35-31, and this is going to be an offensive shootout, and that's exactly what it was. But it wasn't the kind of game that we thought because it was almost like a college football bowl game in that – you see this all the time. They have those long bowl games, the or, the long halftime shows, Orange Bowl, Sugar Bowl, and Team A will dominate the first half, and then out of nowhere, Team B dominates the second half. Right. And you never see that typically in the NFL, but that's what happened in this game. It was 24-7 Niners in the fir- or Lions in the first half. It was 27-7 Niners in the second half. Unbelievable. <laughs> the entire script got the momentum of momentum shifts. Hats off to the NFL script writers. Like I, I didn't see them coming up with that one last night. That was that was very impressive. The way that they uh, unveiled that one on us. They they know suspense. They're fantastic. They should write. For I'll say this too. Them. I like the way that game was officiated for the most part. Um, you know, you play. Yeah, I mean, it's the if you ask most football fans, what do you want out of your officials? They, I think most would say consistency, competency, and become less involved. Right. Call the egregious stuff. Anything that is on the edge of may or may not be, swallow the whistle. Yeah. I mean, like there was a the Charlie Warner hit on the sideline, and you could see the Lions wanted like a late hit. The guy was in the air, and Warner pop, popped him on, along the sideline. Enough of these ticky tack you know, penalties. There was only five total penalties in the game, two on Kansas city, three on the Niners. I like that level of officiating. I like a game where you basically let them go. Um, and, and, and let the players decide that decided. I mean, obviously if there's offsides, you got to call it. There's a false start. You got to call it. There's a PI. You got to call it. But I mean, for the most part, let them play. I like an, uh, I'd rather my games be under officiated than over officiated. Oh, and, and, and not just the NFL, NBA as well, and especially baseball. The NBA, yeah, especially I, the NBA, the parade to the free throw. Like, here's the oh, Joel Embiid got 70. Motherfucker shot like 28 free throws. Of course, I mean, imagine if Steph got 28 free throws on the reg, he'd be at 70 all the time. You know, like it, it's it's ridiculous. Um, some of but you the- know what I'm saying? I hate, I hate, well, they had 12 penalties and we had 11 penalties and it's a right. con. I mean, that it becomes disjointed. It ruins the flow. Yeah, nobody um, likes the ump show. <laughs> keep the flow going. Flow is a big part of, of enjoyable sports. D- having a disjointed game with a, just a boatload of penalties is not my kind of game. This is my one argument against instant replay. It disrupts the flow, and I do agree with you that the flow of a game is paramount to be it, it, to, to be enjoyed. By the I heard game. you do a great interview one night on 95.7 The Game with Steve Kerr you talking about this topic. Do you remember that? Um, and, and not specific, the one that you're, yeah, you're talking you, about. About, like about flow, about you guys were talking about Steve was bemoaning you know, the, the unbelievable disjointed nature of over-officiated games. 
Yeah, no, look, I, and it, I think the conversation basically where Steve said, you know, he wants things to go right, but he'd be glad with an element of human error if it meant we weren't going to the monitor six different times in the last four minutes of the fourth quarter. You know, that's what disrupts the flow of basketball game. And there's no sport that depends on flow for entertainment more than the sport of basketball. So when that gets choppy, it gets really choppy. Yeah. Um, you know, football's built for all sorts of start start and stop moments. It's the nature of the game. Um, but yeah, look, you know, the the best official is the one we don't talk about. The best umpire is the one whose name we didn't even bring up. It's like offensive linemen. I know you had a good game if we ain't even talking about you. Um, that game was tied at 24. Purdy escapes a dead to right sack, hits use check for a first down, twinkle toes. And I love the way that Kyle use check was used in that game. I think he is maybe Kyle Shanahan's biggest. You should do more with that guy than you actually do players. And he had the game that the second tight end, you know, on, on, a, on a team normally has like he, you know, everyone is looking at Vernon Davis. And Delaney Walker had a big game. You know, that's kind of what Juszczyk did last night. You talk about that Delaney the Walker. late third quarter, Kyle uh, Purdy escaped the sack. Yes. And then found Juszczyk for the toe tap on tippy first toe, down. Tippy toes, tippy toes. It was two uh, minutes left in the third quarter, and that was the first play of the drive. Yeah, that was a beautiful play. And it's 20 unanswered points out of halftime. Detroit's second half possessions were turnover on downs, fumble, punt, turnover on downs, and then the touchdown that set them up for the onside kick at the end of the game. And, you know, it's Which funny. Which shade off Conley gave me a heart attack. Yeah, I tell you, that was th that the, the onside kick, the way it was executed was perfect. He got that high, high bounce where now guys are jumping for it, but it did, there was a legal contact. Uh, Lion touched it at about the nine and a half yard line, and that ball's got to go 10 yards before any Detroit Lion can touch it. So it would have been Niners ball even if they hadn't jumped on it. Was it Kittle that fell on it, actually? I think it was yeah, Kittle, Kittle fell, on fell on it. it so, you, um, you know, the other factor in this game that was huge is that the Niners, who did not get particularly good safety play in the Green Bay game, got amazing safety play. If you think about it, I mean, Tayshawn Gibson had the play of the game on the Jameer Gibbs pop-out fumble, and Jair Brown had 10 tackles, five of them solo. Those two guys, the Niners' sa safeties, had a huge hand in that victory. Again, I don't want to talk about off-season moves, but maybe looking to trade Talanoa Hufanga? Because of what you've seen out of Jair Brown here now, and I love Hufanga. No, but I think I think you play them together. Play them together. All right then, I like that too. 